Today, we're going to talk about a small but very important part of our brains, the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the most posterior part of the brain and it consists of an extremely folded layer of cortex and white matter in which four deep cerebellar nuclei are embedded. It weighs only 10% as much as the brain hemispheres, but its surface area is about 75% of that of the cerebral cortex. The cerebellum has long been called a silent area of the brain because electrical excitation of the cerebellum does not cause any sensation or movement. However, activities like running, typing, playing the piano or even talking become possible thanks to the cerebellum. But how can the cerebellum be so important when it has no direct ability to cause muscle contraction? Let's see what the cerebellum actually does. The cerebellum receives continuously information about the desired movement from the brain motor control areas and information from the peripheral parts of the body about their position, speed of movement and forces acting on them with velocities up to 120 meters per second, which is the most rapid conduction in any pathway in the central nervous system. The cerebellum continually collects information about the movements and position of all parts of the body, even though it is operating at a subconscious level. Then, it compares the actual movements as depicted by the peripheral sensory feedback information with the movements intended by the motor system. If the two do not match, then subconscious corrective signals are transmitted back into the motor system to increase or decrease the levels of activation of specific muscles. The cerebellum also aids the cerebral cortex in planning the next sequential movement a fraction of a second in advance, while the current movement is still being executed, thus helping the person to progress smoothly from one movement to the next. But how exactly does the cerebellum affect our movements? Each time we decide to make a movement, a signal is sent from the motor cortex not only to the neurons responsible for the muscle control, but also to the cerebellum, and the cerebellum enhances this signal. As a consequence, this turn-on signal becomes even more powerful than it was at the start, because it becomes the sum of both the cortical and the cerebellar signals. Then, a fraction of a second later, the cerebellar cortex relays an inhibitory output signal to the muscles terminating the initial movement. Typically, when a person first performs a new action, the coordination of movements is almost always incorrect. But after the act has been performed many times, the sequence becomes progressively more and more precise. The ability to learn new movement patterns is possible thanks to the cerebellum. The cerebellum provides us with abilities that we don't even realize. Balance One of the major problems in controlling balance is the amount of time required to transmit signals about position and velocity of the different parts of the body to the brain. Even with a transmission speed up to 120 meters per second, the delay of transmission from the feet to the brain is still 15 to 20 milliseconds. The feet of a person running rapidly can move as much as 25 centimeters during that time. How then is it possible for the brain to know when to stop a movement and to perform the next sequential act, when the movements are performed rapidly? The answer is that the signals from the periphery tell the cerebellum how rapidly and in which direction the body parts are moving, and then the cerebellum can calculate in advance where the different parts will be during the next few milliseconds. The results of these calculations are the key to the brain's progression to the next sequential movement. Preventing overshooting of movements. Almost all movements of the body need an initial momentum in order to begin. Because of this momentum, movements have a tendency to overshoot and not hit the target. If the cerebellum is intact, Subconscious signals stop the movement precisely at the intended point, thereby preventing the overshoot. If overshooting occurs in a person whose cerebellum has been destroyed, a movement in the reverse direction is initiated, attempting to point accurately, but the limb overshoots because of its momentum once more in the opposite direction. Thus, the limb moves back and forth without fixing on its mark. This effect is called action tremor. Automatism.
Most rapid movements of the body, such as the movements of the fingers while typing, occur so rapidly that it is not possible to receive feedback information before the movements are over. These movements are pre-planned to start and then to stop at specific time and distance by the cerebellum. When the cerebellum is removed, three major changes occur. The movements are slow. They don't have enough force. They delay to turn off and they usually go well beyond the intended mark. Timing. Another important function of the cerebellum is to provide appropriate timing for each succeeding movement. Without this timing capability, the person becomes unable to determine when the next sequential movement needs to begin. As a result, the succeeding movement may begin too early or too late. Therefore, lesions to the cerebellum cause complex movements, such as those required for writing or running, to become incoordinate and it is not possible to progress smoothly from one movement to the next. The cerebellum also helps to time events other than movements of the body. For instance, the rates of progression of both auditory and visual phenomena can be predicted by the cerebellum. As an example, a person can predict from the changing visual scene how rapidly he or she is approaching an object. It seems like the cerebellum gives us superpowers. Let's now see how we can check if the cerebellum is intact using specific tests. First, we have the finger-to-nose and finger-to-finger -finger test. In this test, we ask the patient to fully extend their arm and then touch their nose. As an alternative, we can ask them to touch their nose and then fully extend their arm to touch your finger. Then, we can check for the ability to perform rapid alternating movements. One can demonstrate this as repeated pronation and supination of the hands. These movements cannot happen when the cerebellum is injured. Last, we can check for rebound phenomenon. Normally, flexion of the forearm against resistance is quickly stopped when the resistance is suddenly broken off. The patient with cerebellar disease cannot break the movement of the limb and the forearm flies backward in a white arc. We can now understand that despite being small, the cerebellum is extremely valuable for a bunch of activities we take for granted in our everyday lives.